And you should get a notice saying we are recording now. So thank you all for coming. Uh, this is our uh, quarterly meeting, spring quarterly meeting of CCHAB. Um, my name is Dave Karen, as you know, and um, we have our two other co-hosts here. So I will let them introduce themselves. Um, I'm from the University of Southern Cal. Um, and Becky and Sarah, you want to join in? Sure. Becky Stanton, I'm with uh, California Environmental Protection Agency, Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, otherwise known as OEHA. I'm one of the co-chairs. Thanks. And Sarah? Sarah, you may be muted. I can't hear you. Can anyone hear her? Okay, we'll see, maybe she dropped out. We'll see if she gets back on. Uh, you should be looking at the agenda now, hopefully you are. Uh, we've got a few updates, so we're, we're going to jump to those actually pretty quickly. Uh, the first one is going to be by Jamie Smith. Jamie, why don't you share your screen, take it away. How's that look? That looks good. <laughs> okay. All right. So I have a quick update on a um, both a, a new and ongoing project or series of projects um, surrounding remote sensing um, for assessment of harmful algal blooms in California lakes. And this is a project that's led by SWERP. Um, so the project leads are myself, Jamie Smith, and uh, Martha Satulo at SWERP. And we're working collaboratively with both uh, Division of Water Quality and OEMA um, in the State Water Board and the Central Valley um, Regional Water Quality Control Board. So remote sensing, um, we have a great a couple of, like speaker later today talking about remote sensing. Um, why, why do it? Well, as we all know, monitoring harmful algal blooms is a challenge. Um, and when you're working on a regional or statewide scale, as you can see, these are advisories in California for 2020, you know, we're, we're talking about a large geographic area. And so remote sensing is an appealing option as you can cover um, a large area with high temporal resolution. Um, sorry, I got a little um, frog in the throat here. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> And that really requires minimal staff effort compared to sending field crews out. So it's a great compliment. It's obviously not a replacement to NC2 monitoring. Um, but, but, you know, we were just kind of at the beginning in California is getting these tools available. Uh, there's a great kind of tool available through SFEI um, collaboratively with OEMA. Um, but there's more that can be done um, with remote sensing as it's a super practical approach. Right, so remote sensing data are available. Uh, the European Space Agency has the Sentinel-3 series of, of um, sensors, right? There's others as well. Um, and SFEI is projecting this data. You can kind of just look at it at a landscape level. Um, you can look at kind of basic metrics right now, um, like, uh, you know, the CI cyano index over time. Um, but taking it to, to the next level, you know, how do you take that data and then address kind of key management questions like the ones I'm showing, right? Like where, how often are blooms occurring? What are their status and trends? All the way to what are the landscape level drivers? So that's kind of the, the, the questions that are driving this project um, or, or group of, of projects that are kind of kicking off this squirt. So the overall objectives are to conduct a status and trends analysis, um, both on the statewide level, and then a sub a regional uh, sub regional type um, more detailed trends analysis in the Central Valley region uh, mm -hmm. identify uh, use kind of remote sensing paired with landscape level kind of driver assessment and we're going to be doing that in the Central Valley region as a pilot and then with OEMA um, we're going to be working on developing quality assurance and field verification. Um, support uh, data analysis tools and data visualization um, documentation, basically to support the implementation of these tools. The EPA or the Cyan project, which is a consortium of EPA, NOAA, um, NASA, um, they have all you know created a lot of these products. And what we want to do is kind of make these like super accessible to managers to use this data as um, 
as you know for assessment or um, additional kind of yeah. by making these metrics more available. Yeah. And so um, this is my complicated kind of graph here, just kind of showing there's a cup. There's obviously a couple of moving parts here. These are going to these products are going to kind of try to roll out um, over a period of about two years. Um, so right now, Scorp is working on our status and trends assessment with um, the uh, Department of uh, Water Quality Group. Mm -hmm. um, we will then be kind of launching into um, the work with, with OEMA and uh, Region 5 to do driver's assessments, um, uh, status and trends across different scales, and all of the kind of documentation and um, visualization products to kind of underpin that and help support the use of remote sensing for HABs assessment um, more, more broadly. So that I'm at five minutes. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if we wanna take questions, but um, we're hoping to, to provide updates to this group as this project progresses. We probably have a minute or two for a question, if there are any. Okay. I've got a question, Dave. Please go. Um, Jamie, thanks for that presentation. Um, you mentioned that the, some of this work will be done in the Central Valley. Can you identify the water bodies? Um, we will be doing all of the water bodies that are resolvable with Sentinel-3. So that's water bodies that are generally over about 200 hectares. And then there's some specs on like, you know, how skinny the water body, but Clear Lake will definitely be one of the water bodies in this assessment. Okay, will you be reaching out to the tribe on that issue? Um, we certainly can if you're interested. So I can, yeah. I can get in touch with you and let you know a little bit um, more if you're interested. Yeah, yes, please. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Jamie, this is Sue Keitel with EPA. I just wanted to let you know that um, uh, EPA is reviewing what ORD research and development they should be doing in the next three years. And there was something fairly similar and I asked them to get in touch with you if they go forward with that action. So you might expect a call. Awesome. Yeah, we've, we've spoken with them a little bit and we're working with um, the, the EPA folks that have worked on Cyan. And I know that they're doing a few other kind of like landscape level drivers. So I look forward to kind of engaging with them as well. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Okay, maybe we should move on. Um, Becky, I think your announcement is next. Great. Um, we had nominations out for new co-chairs. Um, the three of us have been up for a couple rounds and uh, we got one nomination in, um, which is Jamie Smith, which is great. Um, and so um, based on our charter, we want to keep two, uh, a total of three co-chairs. So um, uh, Sarah and I are willing to continue on. And since Dave um, also has an academic uh, non-state or federal or tribal agency role, he is uh, willing to uh, step off um, so that we keep the diversity of, of representation. So that is our plan given that condition. Um, but if anyone wants to follow up with us offline about that or has any questions, we're certainly willing to address it. But um, given, given that situation and, and our desire to keep things going, um, we wanted to uh, help facilitate as best we could. Thanks. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's a rousing yes. Uh, the silence is consent. Okay, um, next, the next announcement we had was about the, the gender, the general vendor policy, and I'm not exactly sure um, who might be running that or making that. Does anybody want to claim that? Um, maybe I should just announce what that is. So we yeah. we have had some discussion. Uh, we, we've done this with regards to the mitigation subcommittee. Um, at the beginning of the subcommittee activities, we did have a lot of vendors who uh, wanted to come in and give presentations, which is great. We invited presentations that were pushing new cutting edge, environmentally friendly approaches but it ended up moving more towards simply vendors coming on and telling you, kind of selling their wares. 
um, which we weren't too crazy about. Uh, that situation or that question has come up with regards to uh, sort of monitoring, uh, not so much mitigation, but monitoring. And um, there are a lot of good companies out there. Uh, some of them have the same old tools that we've always used. Some of them are pushing new technologies. We don't want to discourage that. But what we did with the mitigation subcommittee, which was that if you do this, if you come on, you can't simply plug your wares. You have to provide information on something that you have done using new cutting edge approaches. You have to show efficacy, you have to show follow up. And we'd like to extend that policy to any vendors coming on that would like to talk about new and exciting monitoring tools. Um, the goal is certainly not to inhibit those presentations, but to prevent those presentations from becoming sort of sales pitches. We actually did have this two or three quarterly meetings ago where we had a vendor come on <laughs> and <laughs> proceeded to take over the meeting for a short per period of time. And so we're just trying to avoid those issues. Uh, if anybody has any comments or if the co-chairs want to weigh in on that, please, please join in. Okay, again, yep, please. Sorry, <laughs> mine's the late one hit the buzzer, I guess. Um, um, so does, does the mitigation subcommittee have a, uh, a little form or something for vendors to fill out to just collect the same information for each one prior to, to presenting? Like, I think something like that could be a, a nice organizational tool to just having a, uh, you know, being able to, um, objectively, you know, review. Eventually. Yeah, that's a great idea. And, and we should probably do that if you who is on now when when Carrie was running the mitigation subcommittee, we it was just sort of a discussion uh, with uh, the lead of, of the subcommittee. Um, Hugh might want to do something like that to do a little more objective vetting, if you will. Um, and if we do this for monitoring, and I think you will talk a little bit about monitoring because he, he has some suggestions for now, since he is in charge of the subcommittee, uh, where the subcommittee might go in future, um, maybe he could talk to that when, when he talks in a few minutes here. And I put in the chat the um, existing vendor policy and case study vetting standards for presentations that are on the Hub portal now. For the for the mitigation subcommittee, so I think we're just talking about extending those to any other situation, such as a, a monitoring method or technology. Yeah, and we're really not trying to thwart anything from coming through, other than the straight sales pitches, which we have had a few of. Um, they're just, I think it's personally, I think it's inappropriate for CC Hab to present a pure sales pitch because in fact, it seems as though CC Hab is not only acknowledging, but perhaps even condoning and, and granting some sort of credibility. And they're basically, some of them were actually sales pitches, which I think we should just stay out of that business. But we do want to vet new and exciting ways of doing monitoring, mitigation, whatever. Other comments? Okay, um, Marissa, I think you're next on uh, the agenda here for announcements about the Benthic Signage Committee. And I think you are still muted. I don't hear you. Sorry. Um, I'm Marissa Van Dyke and I'm at the State Water Board in Sacramento. Uh, sorry about that little glitch there. Um, I'm one of the leads of the Fresh, Freshwater and Estuarine Hab program and wanted to just uh, give an announcement uh, that um, we, along with the co-chairs of CC Hab and um, some subcommittee members um, met uh, regarding the Benthic subcommittee of CC Hab. Um, and that is the <clears throat> subcommittee that um, developed these posting guidelines that I am sharing here right now. Um, these were published um, and adopted in the spring of 2020 uh, by um, CC Hub at large. And we wanted to make everyone aware that we are going to be reconstituting the, the work group, or sorry, the, the subcommittee um, beginning in the fall of this year to, um, to consider new science, um, consider the, the recommended guidelines, perhaps um, uh, 
the, the signage, the wording on the signage, the look and feel of that. Um, so we'll be announcing in the CCHAB liars list, um, you know, it, this summer uh, that we are going to be reconstituting the work group and looking for um, members and also um, a volunteer to lead that subcommittee. Um, I myself am leading another uh, two subcommittees, so I can't take on that role. I just have been uh, trying to reinvigorate um, the group based off of some discussions and requests to um, look at some additional new science. So I uh, just so want to let you all know that. And um, the current guidelines are posted on the California HAB portal, um, and particularly the benthic guidelines and the signs. So please take a look at them. If this sounds a little bit new, I'll put a link in the comments. And um, please feel free to reach out to the co-chairs if you're interested in participating or writing some comments. Thanks. Are there any questions or, or comments from Marissa? Uh, this is Becky. I would just say I, I, I wouldn't want this to um, inhibit from people from using these this season um, as appropriate. So um, just, but we're happy to, um, and and when this was originally adopted, certainly um, see this as an iterative process and you know incremental improvements as we, you know, field test these and see see what the feedback is. Right. And the, um, the HAB program here at the State Water Board will continue implementing these guidelines. They are sound. Um, and again, we're just wanting to let everyone know that we're going to reconvening a work group um, just to take a look at them further again in the fall. Hey, Marissa, I just wanted to let you know what um, in Lake County, uh, what, um, the, what Big Valley Rancheria is doing mm -hmm. uh, is embarking on a um, benthic uh, project in the creeks of the county under the CalWatch project that we're doing. Right. Um, so we, we've been uh, in um, installing spat bags uh, in some locations and doing grab samples. So this whole spring and early summer, we'll have quite a bit of that. On, by, the, by the end of this summer, we'll have a lot of that under, um, under our belts. Um, mm -hmm. and be happy to present on that and, and just, um, you know, keep everybody updated on the things that we're seeing with it. So, um, but yeah, it's quite a, it's very different from, from the uh, planktonic <laughs> program. That's right. That's a lot right. more to it. <laughs> yeah, I've seen an outline of your project. Looking forward to seeing the data as it comes through and the HAB programs implementing, of course, all of the guidelines that CC HAB um, has adopted and will support you guys in interpreting um, how to use those guidelines. And again, um, the guidelines have two different advice, um, two different signs um, for benthics. There's a general awareness sign and then an alert sign to post. And um, the triggers are detailed on this website on when to post each sign. Um, and there's a flow chart to follow, follow through here. So uh, let's take a look at it and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Catherine, and, I think, oops, sorry. Sorry, Catherine. just Becky, I was just gonna say if, if Lake County is interested in getting a, a brief on on any of that for, for potential posting with your work, Sarah, definitely reach out. Okay, Catherine. we've got a, a meeting, uh, a messaging meeting coming up soon with the county. So um, I'll, I will ask that question. Yeah, we do provide training on, um, how to implement the guidelines, particularly for local agencies. Um, the HAP program does, so please reach out. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Catherine, I think you had a maybe a quick question or a comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank Catherine you. Carter, North Kings Regional Board, and I see Rich Badness from the Regional Board is not on right now, so I'm gonna speak on his behalf and just note that I know um, Dave has been communicating with you and he's expected to be on the June CC HAP agenda to present on a monitoring approach that was tested out in um, two of our rivers to test what's the best, method, best methods and approach um, and which toxins are present in which species of benthic um, cyanobacteria. And so he is gonna present next month. And I think that might be really uh, telling for you, Sarah, because I think that um, it has a lot of applicability to streams throughout 
the state and it, it pretty much is just a matter of knowing which um, genera you have and then you can apply it. So if you wanna, if you wanna know that, I can send you the link, it's already on our website that he'll present next month. That sounds great, thank you. Great. Sarah, while we switch over, do you wanna say a little intro? We, we basically did introductions. I think you were having technical difficulties. You wanna just say who you are and where you're from? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, and and yeah. actually, Hugh, you can you should have sharing capabilities. You can scroll up as, as you as she talks. Sorry. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so Sarah Ryan, I'm one of the co-chairs of CCHAB and also the environmental director and emergency management director for the Big Valley Band of Pomo Indians. Uh, we're on Clear Lake and do a lot of um, of the uh, cyanotoxin monitoring and cyanobacteria monitoring on the lake and in the watersheds. So our first of our speakers today is going to be Hugh Dalton, who is the, the new, well, relatively new, it's been a while still, uh, a lead for the mitigation subcommittee. He's going to uh, report on uh, what the committee's been up to and uh, some of the new directions that I think it's going to take. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me, Dave? I can hear you. One second. You can hear me. Okay, great. Can you see my screen? We can see text. Okay. So good morning, everyone. This is Hugh Dalton. I'm a chairperson of the mitigation subcommittee. I'm introducing my three cohorts in the group, uh, Dave Karen, Bill Taylor, and Katie Fong with state water boards. Um, so my text is just basically an outline of the things I have to report today. We've been working together for a few years now as the mitigation subcommittee in the past year, looking at lake evaluations, realizing that we really need some monitoring data and need to develop something for newcomers to the, to the uh, have interest to be able to assess their water body, um, get some data so that we can help them, you know, kind of further understand what's going on different times of the year. So our proposal today is to um, change our name to the Monitoring and Mitigation Subcommittee, and the text reads in order to, you know, accumulate more information, help people, and then further our investigations of study of mitigation as it um, relates to the various problems of uh, water bodies today in California. Um, two small little action items with ponds that were given to me by the state water board, um, one one acre pond in Calaveras County and a seven and a half acre pond in San Luis Obispo have reached out to us for support. Unfortunately, they have no data, no information and really no idea where to start. So kind of working with them over the last year, realizing it'd be nice to develop a monitoring plan that they could work on in order to help us help them with their review. And then finally, point number three is to evaluate and learn from other people that are currently using um, mitigations in our nearby area that we could visit with or learn from and further our interest in um, developing mo a monitoring plan. So today's proposal is just short and sweet, um, plenty of time for questions or from interest from the state board to help support us in any way um, in involving us with maybe larger water bodies or something more diverse within the state of California. So um, discussion or questions? I have a question. You know, I'm, I'm curious about the um, water bodies. So the, the water bodies that are, I guess, the, on your list, Hugh, or just ones that you become aware of. So these are, these are places that don't have a nutrient TMDL yet necessarily, or how do you, um, is there any thought to the potential, um, you know, a listing by the regional board because of these bloom issues, or is this to try to stay away from that? And uh, I just wonder kind of where the, the, um, 
you know, the, the uh, beneficial uses kind of sides of things is being considered when you're um, discussing uh, these types of mitigation projects. Well, the, the two ponds in particular are privately owned. There's, you know, either children, dogs, um, neighbors potentially have access to these water bodies. They're not your typical hab bloom issue ponds, but um, they have over the years indicated that there have been blooms of sorts, um, small amounts of toxins detected. So it kind of feeds back to the overall you know, plan of, of the bigger subcommittee, uh, the bigger group of CC have is that, you know, if you have a problem, do you post a sign? How do you know you have a problem? Likely, you know, testing for more than just toxins during the year can help people. These are just citizens that are very interested in kind of getting a handle on their water. Um, and you could see, we probably have hundreds of reservoirs in California, but hundreds of thousands of ponds. So it's a, a largely overlooked, you know, beginner area, small water bodies are probably easier to fix than larger water bodies. Um, a lot of these probably have the same common problems when it comes to nutrients or overabundance of plants or stagnation. So these are atypical of what would be considered in a lake or a reservoir, but still something really valuable to learn from. And one of the goals of our group is to come up with a small monitoring plan that will be informational but won't be exhaustive and then to look to um, other water managers to see what what's really working and what's not and our group does re hear reports from around California and blooms and things and you know looking at the at the portal map it seems like the same lakes are blooming consistently year to year and the state of California at some point might want to step in and assist some of those problematic areas in the coming years. So it's, it's, it starts small and, and grows to the larger lakes. Sue, I think you had a comment or a question. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm wondering if, um, if maybe a little bit of refinement of the proposed name might be helpful to distinguish it from the normal monitoring that we have so much information on, and this is maybe um, background characterization or something like that, just to so that people don't come in and want you to set up monitoring plans for them for toxins or something like that. Well, that that's a good point. I mean, looking at the research and in the the documents that we have today, I can't think that any citizens going to be able to discern from the long list of testing where they should start or even for us to give any advice on that. I mean, it's it's an exhaustive list of everything and anything as it relates to monitoring or mitigations. And, you know, even even our subcommittee in, in basic words is overwhelmed by the sheer, you know, breadth of knowledge, but somehow that has to be distilled down to something simpler so that people could really learn from it and not be overwhelmed by it. Yeah, if I could just jump in for a bit. So this conversation kind of evolved within the last few subcommittee meetings um, because Hugh did tell us about these uh, two ponds, small lakes that he's he's been working. Uh, and, it, and it really brought up the fact that, in fact, this was discussed um, by, I can't remember who it was now from the water board who was on the meeting as well. And uh, the comment um, that she made was, yeah, you know, we get inquiries from private citizens, from HOAs, from these groups that we really don't want to get involved with. We're not going to go and solve their problem for them. Maybe they're too small. Maybe they're totally private. Maybe there are other extenuating circumstances, but they really seem to fall through the cracks. Uh, they don't have, they're often not large. They're small ponds around on somebody's property. Um, they may or may not have influences coming from off their property, but they really don't know what they're doing. And they can't seem to get the water board to help because maybe it's not the water board's purview. The county doesn't care. The town is not involved. And so they seem like they have nowhere to go, which is unfortunate because, and I've worked with a few of these small HOAs, some of them are very committed to, to fixing their water but they don't know where to start. So this started a conversation within the subcommittee of, well, if we're gonna talk about 
possible mitigation that they can do, we need to know something about the water that they're dealing with and the condition of it and what's causing their problem. Uh, Hugh's done some site visits to a few of these and we all sort of agreed. I wish, I don't think Bill Taylor is on the line. I wish he were, cause he could certainly speak to it. Um, but he knows, and, and you know, that, you know, the boots on the ground, getting a look at the terrain where the problem is originating, or at least what maybe some of the primary suspects are for uh, the issues causing problems for a particular water body. Those can be sussed out pretty easily by somebody with experience um, who can actually look it over. And then you could actually maybe make some intelligent decisions about uh, what could be done in terms of mitigation, prevention, whatever. Um, this kind of got into the conversation. Well, what we really need for those people or those entities that want help is we need to be able to get somebody out there to look it over, to make some decisions or get some, gather some thoughts and then discuss it within the subcommittee and, and perhaps actually have the subcommittee as a group to whom that HOA or a private person could come and ask questions, get some reasonable information and maybe get some guidance. So that's kind of, I think, where this idea of, well, then we really need a monitoring and mitigation subcommittee. And maybe one thing that we could do is specifically address some of these water bodies that are falling through the cracks. And there are a great number of them because they're not giant drinking water reservoirs, so they don't have that cachet or they're not huge lakes with lots and lots of people around them, so they don't have that cachet, but it would still seem to be um, a, a very good use of the time for the mitigation subcommittee. And in turn, um, they, the subcommittee would be able to get a better handle on the problems that our, uh, people are experiencing around the state. Um, we talked about, and this is something that Carrie at started a while ago. How do we get people out there? Well, you know, we came up with this sort of HAB SWAT team, which kind of got out of control and it involved vehicles and boats and all these things. Whereas we maybe we don't need to do that for a real first, uh, quick first pass and get some evaluation and then maybe talk to the people, let them use the subcommittee as a source of information for making decisions. Um, about how they want to go forward, uh, if they want to go forward with mitigation. That get into the issue of where do we get the money for that? And I think, um, Hugh, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Hugh, I think your idea was, well, if there was a, a place in the state where we could get small sums of money to do this, because it would be travel for one or two of us, and that's about it. Uh, however, uh, my thought is also, if some of these HOAs are committed until they find out they actually have to pay something and then they're not committed. So, well, if they're going to do that, then they're not going to clean their water. Um, so if maybe they should be the ones to pay for the travel, in which case, uh, if they would pay for the travel, it shows that they have commitment. That way they do get the in investment of the, the subcommittee to help them out and give them some guidance. So that was kind of a, a talk. I think it evolved around two or three meetings, I think, didn't it, you? Yeah, I mean, you did mention um, reimbursement for travel, but the other thing that could be considered is um, some basic monitoring equipment for field analyses. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of field instruments, but I know they can be um, informational at the time. And I, I do like water samples going to a certified lab. So it's, it's just that beginning of understanding what's going on, I mean, Likely ponds and lakes don't all have the same problems, but they might have similar outcomes, you know, being unbalanced or prone to, you know, certain types of overgrowth of either, either algae or plants or whatever it is. Um, but we need to kind of understand a little more, you know, individually what's going on in each location. And we have developed, um, Bill Taylor was instrumental in, in developing our initial lake assessment form. You know, we've got some good field monitoring information, some laboratory stuff. I mean, we're, we're ready to evaluate something if we get the go ahead. That sounds like um, a really important need and a, a, a good description. Thank you. 
my my knee jerk reaction is that monitoring is still kind of a complex word, and you used a couple words like assessment or evaluation, and um, you know I'm I'm not stuck on it. It's just my my thoughts for your consideration, and I really appreciate the work that you guys are pulling together. It's obviously a, a need. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to elaborate on the assessment, um, initial lake assessment. That's in you know, pulling out basic, you know, water volumes, lake shape, you know, previous history, understanding of what, whatever the lake owner knows that's happened in the past. And then of course, an initial, an initial monitoring assessment kind of tells, tells us where we're starting. Um, I have extensive, you know, experience with one lake. So it's a good sized lake. It has its own unique problems, but ponds are new to me. And, and it seems that over the years I've listened to big lake problems and big lakes typically can't fix their problems because the volume of water is too large. So here we are in California, little lakes could be fixed, um, but at the beginning, at least they can be evaluated. Yeah, so I would think if the if the hang up is over the word monitoring, I think yeah that that we're probably talking different things. I don't think I don't think any of these places are going to be willing or interested in setting up massive monitoring programs to measure toxins and all kinds of things. We're thinking I think more along the lines of assessment. So one of the things that you mentioned on one of the small ponds that he looked at, um, you know, the pond itself was around somebody's property. Uh, but you walk up a stream and there's a horse farm, you know, uh, right up the stream. Well, it's pretty clear where some of their problem is coming from. That quick assessment doesn't really constitute monitoring per se, um, but gathering a few pieces of information on what's the lake pH, you know, what's the dissolved oxygen near the bottom, what, you know, those kinds of things while they fall under the broad category of monitoring, they're not monitoring, I think, in the sense of what we think of as a full-blown HAB monitoring program. They're more along the lines of assessment, if that makes sense. And that, that's a good point, Dave, is that a lot of water bodies tend to monitor within the water body rather than looking at the inputs and the outflow. And it's crucial to see those things in order to understand, you know, what what the um, what the inputs are, because that that likely is part of the problem, or or maybe not. So again, the assessment is in and out as well as inside of the water body. Other comments or questions? Yeah, this is Marissa. I um, just want to say thanks for clarifying. Um, you know you're using the words monitoring and assessment. I hear, hear everyone um, in that discussion um, that we kind of see it here is different things, particularly with the monitoring strategy uh, that came out and spent several years developing. So, um, you know, the HAP program totally recognizes that this monitor, uh, the mitigation subcommittee, um, you know, does great work and, and it has been putting together these assessment um, assessment plans. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, we appreciate you taking a look at, um, you know, your group taking a look at um, some of the ponds, smaller ponds that come through the HAB reporting system um, that's on the HAB portal. Um, the water boards, you know, make towards that report form and uh, the number of reports have been increasing um, exponentially each year and we've got fairly limited resources to respond to them. Um, and we've been prior prioritizing response to, um, you know, um, based off of like, the number of recreators um, and the uses of, you know, larger lakes and reservoirs and highly used um, rivers and streams and so forth. So I um, appreciate you guys um, supporting some of these smaller ponds that um, do get, you know, fall through the cracks, I guess you could say, or just um, there's not enough funding to um, prioritize them as well, fortunately. And uh, we, we hope that that will change in the future, but um, currently we, we don't know of any um, additional funding on the radar, but we will be pursuing that um, uh, in, in the next couple of years. Well, I would say the goal, uh, Marissa, is, is not certainly to pile up, you know, more places that need to be fixed. Uh, the, the idea is to provide right. people who are presently falling through the cracks mm -hmm. and getting nothing and 
including information on how they themselves might do something to help their own waters. Um, that's really, I think, what this would be focused on. Right, you can correct right. me if I'm wrong. It's, um, it's a good summary. It's like, you know, it's the steps that they can take to inform them. That's right. Other comments or questions? Hugh, do you have anything else you want to add? Mm, that's pretty good. I mean, I guess as a guy says a summary, you know, we have to understand the problem before we can even begin to think of an appropriate solution. And our committee is focused on the non-chemical mitigations, of course, first, because it's the easiest, it's the safest and probably the biggest benefit to begin with first. Um, and hopefully these small water bodies can be aided in their way of making a more healthy water quality so that you know you don't have to use chemicals and you don't have to go down that line. And further speaking to larger water bodies, it'd be nice to be able to uh, advise on larger mitigations that can be successful to keep HAPs from, from coming back every year in these problem water bodies throughout the state that are on the portal. Okay, um, thanks Hugh. If there are no further questions or comments, we're running about five minutes ahead of time, but um, I'm sure Becky can fill some of that space, I would think. Uh, Becky uh, Stanton is our next speaker, and she's going to talk about the ITRC Benthic um, uh, HCB guidance and training. Becky? Great. Are you seeing my presentation? Uh, yes, we screen? are. Great, thanks. Um, so appreciate the opportunity to do uh, kind of an update on where we're at with the ITRC harmful cyanobacterial bloom teams. Um, I know I've covered some of this before, but just a little bit of refresher on some new information. I'll put uh, the link in the, in the chat too of our guidelines uh, document. And there's also a link to the training that I'll put in there. Um, this is something I'm a co-team leader on with Ben Holcomb of Utah Department of Environmental Quality, and our program advisor is Sherry, Sherry Basinger. Um, we did an original HCB guidelines that I know several of you were involved with. That was kind of a broader overview of uh, HCBs in general, um, but a greater focus on the more well-known work on planktonic or water column cyanobacteria. And I've listed the different uh, segments um, that are included in that um, and a capture of the homepage um, as it um, uh, appeared at that time. We do have a live training on that uh, next week. Um, and so um, we certainly, um, if you haven't participated in that previously, um, ITRC does uh, uh, frequent rounds of, of the live interactive training as well as archiving the training. Um, there is an archive of the previous version. You're welcome to join the live one or it will be archived as well. Um, and we definitely um, welcome people to uh, take a look at that guidance document, work through it, check out the, uh, the tools and the resources there. Um, we've also put together a, an identification video um, I know um, uh, Waterboards has a, a visual guide, so this is just an opportunity to have um, a, a video walkthrough with some different people with some more um, uh, context of what it looks like in the field, as well as the, the jar and soup test, um, as well as um, things that we might see in the environment that are not cyanobacteria. So uh, definitely recommend taking a look at that. Um, and then because benthic cyanobacteria can be pretty unique, um, as we, we brought up earlier, um, it can occur in clear water and higher flow. And so oftentimes when we've had potential illnesses reported, people are concerned that, but the water looked fine or I didn't see anything. Um, and it's definitely more complicated that way. Um, and because it may be, you know, growing as a, as a, as a mat on the bottom, it may not be as, as visible as something discolored or, or floating at the surface. Uh, the environmental conditions can affect growth differently. Oftentimes, 
um, the standard line of, of stagnant, uh, warm eutrophic water doesn't necessarily apply for these types of blooms. So um, some considerations there. And certainly uh, we're aware of uh, both human and animal impacts, particularly some of the dog deaths that have been associated with mat contact and injection. And then neurotoxins such as anatoxin A, as shown in um, the um, uh, North Coast Benthic report that was mentioned earlier, um, has demonstrations of that as well as other toxins. Um, and so the guidance is available now. There's the link, but I'll also put it in the chat. And so that covers a broad overview of the benthic uh, cyanobacteria ecology, um, and does a deeper dive into cyanotoxins that we share across both uh, documents now. Um, because we didn't um, cover that in as much depth in the first document. Um, we've got information specifically on, on benthic monitoring and added benthic HCBs into the visual guide. Um, we did updates on the management strategy sheets um, and also cover some of the benthic uh, communication response, including the um, current iterations of the CC Hub signs. And that live training will be happening also next week on Thursday. Uh, same time frame. So certainly welcome if you haven't done it. Um, they're kind of built as companions um, to take both of it, but uh, you're certainly welcome if you're already aware of the, the main overview just to focus on, on that one as well. Um, here's an example of what the monitoring tool looks like now, um, particularly for if you uh, check uh, benthic cyanobacteria. Um, we've also got it split between um, if a lab is required and what the ballpark turnaround time is not including, you know, shipping to a lab. Um, and then we've got a highlighted the different um, uh, sections that would be um, potentially applicable, applicable for benthic. Uh, the hyperlinks in, in the methods column uh, go to that section in the, the benthic HCB document. We've got different color coded um, symbols based on um, presence, absence, um, tax identification, density and abundance. Um, and then if you clicked uh, cyanotoxin separately, you'd get uh, methods for uh, cyanotoxin evaluation. Um, and then some general qualifications in terms of how quantitative or qualitative the results are, approximate cost and some uh, amount of training necessary. Um, and then we updated the management tool for folks who um, were using the, the previous version in HCB1. Um, it was a little more complicated in terms of what you could check on and off um, as far as criteria. And so we've simplified the, um, uh, the ones up top that you can uh, select or deselect um, to ones that are really um, uh, distinguished between the methods. Um, so you'll get a list based on that. I know we also got a comment though, um, even though we can have plain tonics in rivers, we didn't have a specific category for rivers as water body types. It's certainly um, uh, more uh, common for, for benthic, um, but we do have that as a, as a specific delineator if there's um, methods that would be less appropriate for a river versus a lake or reservoir. Um, and then if there is some distinguishing between um, plain tonic or benthic, we have that. Um, as you'll see, there's a documented effectiveness section, and we've got that um, both for planktonic and benthic. Overall, certainly the amount of information for benthic is less, um, but there are some, and so we certainly want people to um, consider um, uh, that type of information when they go through. And then the, the management strategy, the hyperlinks go to those updated fact sheets that now have information uh, for both types of uh, cyanobacteria. Um, and if there's any questions, my email is up there and we certainly encourage people to uh, show up for the trainings and I'll follow up with us if there's any questions. Thank you. Becky, can you put the link for the trainings in um, the chat? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments? For Becky? Yes, this is Hal. Um, are you kind of working with the inland group, uh, the inland swim group, about uh, trying to merge signage for this, for uh, 
algal mats and uh, E. coli results and things like that? Um, not at this point. I know we have um, attended some of those meetings and talked some about that, but um, we are not currently set for that. And I know what's um, somewhat what's on their map has been um, a little bit challenging in terms of trying to get things up, um, at least last I looked. But um, it is a good point, and I, I am on that list to try to attend when I can. But thanks for the um, pointing, pointing that, that option out. Thank you. If any of the other co-chairs want to weigh in on that, or or Marissa, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Other comments? No, we good. We we're running a little early, so you know, don't hesitate if you've got a, a thought or a comment. Actually, if anyone has any other uh, announcements as well, we really didn't uh, make that offer to everyone. Does anyone have any announcements or things that they think need to be brought to the attention of this group? Silence. A quiet one. Here we Sue. go. Sue, sorry, go ahead. No problem. Um, so I just wanted to let people know we learned um, yesterday that Leslie Danglada, who is the lead PAB person for EPA and the Habarka work group, is taking a new position, and she is going to be starting that position in about two weeks. So uh, we have a, a gap at EPA, but I just thought I'd let people know as they may or may not reach out to her directly. Um, but we'll, as a as an EPA team, try to cover the very big shoes she leaves behind. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, or announcements? Okay, a quiet Wednesday. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll we'll take our break now. Uh, we're running about 10 minutes ahead, which I think we should just get back on our 10.15 restart. So we'll have about 15, 20 minutes here where people will be able to shake their heads and make that extra cup of coffee or tea. And hey Dave, so, sorry. Yeah. Um, I just realized um, for folks that are interested, I know Jamie's on. The U.S. HAB Symposium in October, I think uh, abstracts are due May 6th, so people are interested. That deadline, at least, is coming up fairly fairly short. Yeah, thank you, Becky. I can put the uh, link for that meeting in the chat. And we are, um, well, actually now, Jamie, you three are now going to wiggle the date of the next quarterly so that it does not conflict. Is that correct? Yeah, I think we're looking at uh, July 27th for the July meeting, and then I don't think we've fixed the October meeting as the one that will conflict with the U.S. TAB symposium. Um, so that'll probably shift earlier in October. That's correct, because the U.S. just, I guess, if we're, if we're talking about that meeting too, they're, they're trying a new format where on the Tuesday, I, uh, I don't have the dates in front of me, but at the Tuesday of that meeting, I believe that would be the 25th, but they're going to have a hybrid day where all of their content is focused around uh, harmful algal bloom management. And that day is intended to help facilitate people that aren't able to travel in person um, to the meeting. Um, and they're going to have a discounted price for managers to, to register for that hybrid day. They're still working out the details of, um, of that, but um, keep, keep uh, uh, an eye out for announcements about uh, the hybrid manager's day. <laughs> okay, great. Anything else? All right, why don't we break? We'll see you all back at 10.15. We'll have another presentation then. Thank you. Hi there, uh, welcome back everyone. Um, we're about a minute out. If anyone has any announcements that they would like to make, please do so.
Okay, I think we're we're good. Uh, Becky, did you have or Sarah, did you have anything to to add or state? Uh, thanks. Okay, so I think we're ready to go. Then uh, we've got another presentation coming up. Uh, this is going to be on remote sensing approaches to characterizing harmful algal blooms in inland waters by Carl Leglighter. Um, Carl, I see you've already got your slides up and you're ready to go. So take it away. Yeah, thanks very much, David. I appreciate the invitation to present and, and to Becky as well for reaching out to me initially. And uh, it's a great opportunity to share with the group that I didn't know about, but just a little bit that I saw from uh, the first part of today's seminar. I think you're doing a lot of interesting work and Becky's um, talk was a nice lead into what I'll be doing because I'm focused um, a lot of this research on, on benthic algae rivers. So, all right, so an overview, first I'll give some context. Um, I'm with the US Geological Survey. We have a, a project dedicated to remote sensing of water quality and algae is certainly one aspect of that. Um, we're working towards some operational workflows. I'll give a few highlights from that. Um, the paper that Becky noticed initially was um, trying to extend this type of work to river systems and focusing on a, a river in, in, uh, in Arkansas, the Buffalo. I'll share some results from that. And then kind of a sneak preview. It's, it's um, work that is currently under review. Um, hopefully it'll be published soon, but I decided to let the cat out of the bag because I think it's pretty exciting. So that's where we're headed. So first of all, uh, my agency has uh, what we're calling the Next Generation Water Observing System, or NGWAS. And one component of that is remote sensing of water quality. So we're interested in, in deriving various metrics from all kinds of image data, both looking backwards, real time, hopefully, and then um, trying to plan ahead to take advantage of some new instrumentation that will be um, launched in the, in the future as well. And we're hoping to do both the operational application that is sort of what the USGS is, is known for, as well as research and development to provide us with some new capabilities in the future. So far, these activities are focused in what we're calling integrated water science basins and sort of pilot areas. Uh, we started the Delaware uh, two years ago, Upper Colorado, which is near where I live in, in Golden, Colorado. Um, the Illinois, I'll, I'll share some results um, momentarily, and then just announced recently was the Lamet, which would be more um, relevant to some of the issues you're dealing with in California. So I think the emphasis there is going to be more on, on fisheries kinds of things. The Illinois was chosen largely because of um, HAB related issues. So uh, this is an example of more of the, the current operational approach we're trying to, to put together. Been using data from um, satellite sensors that are freely available, Landsat, you probably have heard of, has 30 meter pixels, passes over every 16 days. There's a couple um, operated by the European Space Agency called Sentinel that have 10 meter pixels in a, in a short return period. So the combination of those two things, we can get coverage um, about every five days on average of a given location, provided there's not clouds. Uh, we can't control that. So this overall focus on water quality involves um, examining turbidity, chlorophyll A's, clearly the, the one most related to, to algae, um, dissolved organic matter. So we've pulled from the literature existing approaches for calculating some variable from an image that we then attempt to link to these water quality metrics. Another component of the project is looking at surface temperature because that can also influence algal development and we're trying to quantify the uncertainty associated with these estimates by developing an ensemble approach. So the workflow involves ingesting the satellite imagery. Um, it's available within about 12 hours at most of when it's acquired. And then we have to account for the atmosphere um, to make things consistent. Uh, it's, and this is an example from Idaho where a lot of this, this work is focused initially. Um, we then calculate those indices is this, uh, forgive me, but um, are you all seeing the, uh, the bar at the top of my screen here? It's kind of obscuring the slides. 
Not no. sure I see a bar. I see okay. it. No, that's it good. Yeah, fine. it's just yeah. it's a zoom thing, and I thought it, it. Yeah, just I can't read the top of the slide, but if you're not seeing it, that's that's great. Okay, yeah, sorry to break my own stride there, but um, we then calculate those spectral variables and link it to the water quality metrics. And because we have a series of these relationships, we can calculate ensemble statistics. So we have not just a mean, but some some measure of the variation about that. So, and then ultimately we want to deliver that content in a way that is readily accessible to the general public. Okay, so one problem with remote sensing of, of algal blooms is that we can't directly detect, and it's sort of a, an ironic set of words I realize, we can't directly remotely sense toxigenic algae, okay? We can tell when there's chlorophyll there, and that means there's some kind of photosynthetic matter, but is that on the bottom in the water column? Is it floating? Um, is it a macrophyte, some other type of aquatic vegetation? Uh, with more spectral information, we can get to specific pigments like phycocyanin, which would indicate that we have cyanobacteria. So that's sort of where things are currently. This is work on off the press from the Illinois Integrated Water Science Basin. My colleague, Tyler King, who's the manager of the uh, water quality project, put these results together just last week. So this is further upstream within the basin and we have relatively low amounts of chlorophyll, but this is a longitudinal profile down the, the whole length of the Illinois River. And um, we get a little bit further downstream, closer to St. Louis, and we see that there's quite a bit higher concentrations of chlorophyll. So I think this is encouraging for our ability to, to provide much more spatial information about these, these sorts of blooms. So that is all coming soon to a river near you. It's the trailer. And the feature length film is um, this, these photos remind me of like a, a bad B movie science fiction slime monster kind of thing from the 50s. But that, that is how most people interact with and perceive um, these benthic algal blooms. I think Becky had some nice images to illustrate that too. So there, these are getting to be more and more of a problem. I think we're all aware of that. Um, recreational opportunities were severely compromised, have all sorts of negative impacts on the ecosystem. Um, public health, Becky mentioned the dog deaths, no one wants to see that happen. So one place where this has become an issue is the Buffalo River. It's, it's actually the Buffalo National River. It's managed by the Park Service. So there's a partnership between my agency and a park service focused on all aspects of water quality. And we got a small amount of funding to do kind of a, a, a pilot study to assess whether we could use remote sensing methods to, um, to at least map out where these benthic algal blooms are occurring. Okay. So the study areas in Northern Arkansas, it's very much the Ozarks. And we had several different kinds of data um, shown here, the, the overview is satellite image and then these insets are the two main regions we focused on. Um, the one farther upstream is shown at the bottom here, that's Gilbert and Mommy is the second one. And this is a, an appropriate place to, to take this on because the water is fairly clear, first of all. And this is a place where these algae are a real problem. There's 83 species of fish in the park, Eight of those are officially listed as species of concern by the state of Arkansas, and then there's a couple of mussel species that are federally listed. And over the past few years, the Park Service staff have documented um, more extensive blooms. Those therefore compromise visitor experiences even more. Um, you know, people are just just not going to go canoeing, boating, fishing, that kind of thing, because it like you, much of the algae that's there is this long filamentous strands that can like. It's kind of frightening. Like you can actually get like stuck with your, you know, your your ankles wrapped around this stuff and have a hard time moving. And then, um, you know, the nuisance aside, there has been some cyanotoxins um, detected for the first time recently. And there's really a need for efficient monitoring because you can see this is a long stretch of river. Um, so the data was collected just in those two study reaches, and this was my colleague with the Park Service, Sean Hodges, the co-author on this paper. It was just he and one assistant, and that's just really not <laughs> practical at all for any kind of larger scale or more frequent operational monitoring. So that's what we we're hoping to do with the 
remote sensing, but one caveat to the study is that we had quite a gap between when the earliest satellite images were, occur were collected. Field data was just um, Sean and his, um, Derek, his colleague, on two days and then another three weeks or so to the last of these satellite images. So uh, the field observations consisted of a series of transects railway spaced along the river, about 18 to 20 points on each one, and uh, they made measurements of water depth and a visual estimate of the percent cover of benthic algae within a 0.3 by 0.3 meter area of the stream bed and got locations of all the measurements with the handheld GPS. Um, so it's a fairly complicated river. Much of it is bedrock controlled, but there are some pretty dynamic bars. So that ends up leading to a range of depths. And the visual observations of the algal density, this is for the Gilbert reach, bias towards um, pretty low amounts of, of algae on the bed, but the other reach was a more even distribution of algae um, but we aggregated this, the original field data, which was collected just at 10% field increments, or increments in the field, I should say, um, to four more general categories. So whether there's no algae, a low density, 0.1 to 0.3% cover, medium or high. So a lot of my previous research before I um, got started working on algae. I'm, um, I'm definitely not a biologist. I'm very new to all of this. So when I attend things like today's session, it's, it's a really good education for me. But much of my remote sensing work has been on estimating water depth from images. And I hypothesize that the water depth is going to influence where and how much algae is, is in the river because they require light for photosynthesis. Deeper water is not going to allow as much penetration of light. So Use a technique I, I developed previously called optimal band ratio analysis it involves taking the different spectral bands, computing a ratio of for all those different combinations of bands, taking a logarithm of that that gives us this image derived quantity X that we then regress against the field measurements of depth. And then the optimum part is the one that gives us the highest R squared. So this is a matrix showing the different wavelength bands and the, the darker blue are the ones that lead to a stronger relationship between this image derived quantity and depth. So this is an example from a, an eight band multispectral image from the, the mom you reached that was further downstream. So this is a table summarizing the results across the three different types of sensor, all the different dates, there were a total of nine and the two different reaches. So just some, some highlights. We had better results downstream at Maumee because there's a broader range of depths in the field survey. And that it's just the statistical reality. It leads to um, a stronger relationship. Um, the phase one air photos, as opposed to the other two data sources were from satellites gave us better results because of the higher spatial resolution. But there's nothing special about those photos. They're, they do have a near infrared band, but that's not unusual. And you actually don't use that for the depth retrieval anyway. It turns out the, the red and green bands are the best band ratio. But one thing to keep in mind before getting too excited about this is that it definitely is limited to pretty shallow and definitely uh, clear flowing streams. If the water is more turbid or deeper, then this is not going to be a viable approach. So the algae, um, in terms of their spectral characteristics, so these are spectra extracted from the images at the locations where the field observations were made. And we see there's not a lot of difference between the 11 levels that were mapped in the field. A little bit more separation when we aggregate it to those four categories. And that's with eight bands from worldview. But if we look at the planet satellite data, which had only four bands, it's even harder to tease these apart. So we threw some heavy machinery at it in terms of the classification approach. Um, this is a figure I uh, discovered in a paper about bovine viruses, which I don't normally read, but it's the best illustration of this method that I've encountered. So it's, it's something we call random forest or a bagged tree. Bagging is bootstrap aggregation. So if you have original total data set, you're going to subsample that over and over n times and then train a classification method based on each of those subsamples. And the, the classification method is called a decision tree. So for each tree, you're going to drop in some observation. In this case, it has both the spectral information from the images as well as the depths that we derive from those images. And it 
propagates down through the tree. These are branches. It's like a dichotomous key. Each pink node is where a decision is made. And then the terminal nodes or leaf is where we assign it to a class. So it's either red or green in this little cartoon example. So it's called a forest because it consists of many, many trees. And each tree gets a vote and we settle this like a democracy or statistically it's the mode of those decisions or the votes from each tree becomes the output prediction for that class. So um, this approach is advantageous because you can take all the observations that were not in a particular bag to assess the accuracy. And it also allows for different kinds of variables, you know, spectra versus the depths and kind of implicitly accounts for any nonlinearity or interactions between those predictor variables. Okay, so this is how it fits into the overall workflow. You have the field data collection for the depth measurements as well as the algal cover estimates, acquire the images. It's a little bit of pre-processing just to mask out the water itself, smooth the image to beat down the noise. I did all of this in MATLAB and then there's a, a classification function called fit C and symbol C for classification in the bag method. And then the OBRA that I um, described previously is how we get the depth. So that becomes another predictor along with the spectral information to do this random forest classification. Um, another aspect of, of this analysis is called K-fold cross-validation. It's how we assess the accuracies and taking observations that were not used to train a model and um, then classifying those observations based off the model. So it's um, a way of uh, evaluating how well it really works. Okay, so here's some of the results from those. This is five different dates from the Gilbert reach. And it's kind of pixelated and sort of patchy. Things change over time, but there are some, some plausible patterns. And I was kind of underwhelmed when I first saw this, but Sean, who actually works on this river and probably knows it any, better than anybody else, is quite excited. and. Uh, for example, here on the Gilbert Reach, we see a persistent zone of pretty high algal density. If I hadn't masked this out, you'd see this is a, a bar here that's vegetated. Whereas up above this, at least the last four dates, we've got an area that has um, little or no algae. And Sean said that that's, that's spot on with his knowledge of this, um, this part of the river from his direct field experience. And similarly for the other site up here at the, uh, the upstream end of the reach, we see this zone where it's persistently high algal density throughout the whole time series. And um, going back to the accuracy assessment, this is a tool commonly used in remote sensing that is appropriately called a confusion matrix. And um, every time I look at these, I still am a little bit confused at first, that's why. So the rows here are the true classes. That's what was mapped in the field. And then the different columns are what was predicted from the images using that random forest method. So anything that's on the diagonal of this matrix, that means that what was mapped in the field jives with what was predicted from the image. That's good. So those are the, the correct ones. And anything off the diagonal means that even though this was classified as no algae or coded as zero here, 12% of that, of those pixels were actually mapped as a low density field. So, um, and then this, this table on the right is sort of distills that a bit and shows the true positive rate in the first column. So that's the number or the proportion of pixels that were mapped as having a, well, I'll just focus on the, this is probably what we're most interested in as far as a true positive is the highest algal density. So 86% of the pixels that were mapped with high density in the field were also classified correctly from the image. And then the false negative rate would be the other 14%, which we were split evenly, the misclassifications between the, the medium and the low classes. Fortunately, we didn't think there was none there when it was actually high. So um, then this table summarizes the results across the different dates and an evaluation of that hypothesis that the depth information would facilitate classification and that that did um, tend to be true, not in, not in every case, particularly for the sky side images. Um, overall classifications were generally better at the Maumee site further downstream, which is also where the depth retrieval was better. Probably not a coincidence there, but even you know, using a you know, fairly advanced or not 
I mean, I didn't make up that method, but it's, you know, it's on a well accepted remote sensing method and likewise for the depth retrieval. Um, these are not outstanding accuracies. I was, was not real um, pleased. I mean, Sean was more enthusiastic than me, but it was, it's just proves to be a more difficult problem than I anticipated. So I think there's some potential here. Um, obviously there's significant incentives for developing this approach further, I think. And this initial proof of concept study, I think was, was encouraging enough to, to, to do further work along these lines because it would allow for much more efficient detection and mapping over much broader areas, including places that are just difficult to get to. Like Sean said that there's no way that he and Derek could go out and map the whole Buffalo River as much as he might enjoy trying to do that. Um, another advantage potentially is that we could identify hot spots where excessive algal growth tends to occur. Maybe it's where tributaries come in some sort of point source of nutrients. Um, and then that doing that over and over um, through time could yield some insight on what are the causative factors that, that lead to these benthic algal blooms in certain places. And this is the sort of analysis I think that we could try to do. Um, you know, again, we just had a few dates of image acquisition, but on the Gilbert Reach, for example, we see that for the, the latter four, or sorry, latter three images, that we have a pretty steady increase in the amount of the reach that was mapped as, as a high density. So that's the upside on uh, the limitations. Just uh, I always feel it's important to give people realistic expectations. So this was just a limited um, pilot study. We didn't cover an especially large area, just those two field sites. Um, we had long gaps between when the field data were collected and when the images were acquired, conditions certainly could have changed during that time. Um, I, some of the images were freely available, at least for the USGS, we can make requests for worldview satellite acquisitions. The planet satellite, we did have to purchase. The air photos came through a collaboration with the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is also part of the Department of Interior, so we got a pretty good rate on that. But there, there is some expense in acquiring the images for, for most, most cases. Um, you've got to know what to do with them afterward. There's some specialized software that can be involved. Um, one of the main takeaways from, from my point of view is that these sensor characteristics can be pretty significant and that having more spectral information could really be uh, valuable. Um, as far as how you go about collecting the data, there's different platforms. They all have their issues. So like the satellites, you've got to look through the whole atmosphere. There can be clouds. Um, if you want to do the airborne acquisition, that requires coordinating with the contractor. That can be, can be tricky. Um, uncrewed aircraft systems or drones are, are potentially a viable solution, but at least for the federal agencies and certainly with any lands that are, mod, are uh, managed by the Park Service, you can't operate them um, right now. So there's some regulatory hurdles there. Again, just to reiterate, you've got to have shallow, clear water. Maybe it goes without saying, but you can't have trees hanging over the river. You need to be able to see the water. And you know, for the same reasons that it's difficult to monitor in the field, those issues don't go away um, with remote sensing either. Like you really want to have this timed closely because these can be really dynamic phenomenon. So, okay, so moving on to the, the last part of my presentation, getting back to the R&D and um, shifting back to, to lakes so far at this point. So I showed this target earlier, but we really want to get to this bullseye. Like how do we know when we have algae that are toxigenic? You know, that, that's where they really are potentially harmful algal blooms. Okay. So as a federal employee, I've become a, a great lover of, of acronyms. Um, so rather than repeat the lovely phrase spectral mixture analysis for the surveillance of harmful algal blooms, which no one should have to repeat more than once, works out to smash, which invokes visions of guitars and TVs and home runs and other more enjoyable things like that. So this is some work that, uh, that Tyler King and I and a host of other people have been doing. Um, we actually haven't done much for a while because it's been in review for several months now, but it consists of two basic inputs. So we've got spectra that we measure in a lab of different uh, types of algae at the genus level. And then we have hyperspectral satellite images. Hyperspectral just means that there's lots and lots of narrow wavelength ranges. And with those two inputs, you can generate a map of which kinds of cyanobacteria are present. 
Not just that they're there, not just the concentration of some pigment, but what kind. And so we round up the usual suspects. There's a published spectral library. It's a USGS science-based data release. So far, it has 12 end members um, at the genus level. These are microscope images um, that show some of them. Um, Anna Bina was actually one of the slides that, that Becky shared previously. Um, a phantasomenon, also known as AFA, that's also a mouthful. Um, but this is a pretty specialized facility. We've got a hyperspectral camera connected to a microscope. And so we've got these 12 so far, but we really want to be able to um, augment that in the future by getting more field samples, shipping them off to this lab at USGS headquarters as quickly as possible. It has to be FedEx overnight, kept an eye on all that to make sure the samples are still in good shape when they get there. Um, so then the other inputs, the uh, satellite images. Um, DSIS stands for the DLR, which is the German equivalent of NASA. I don't speak German, but I'm going to attempt that one. But the rest of it is Earth System Imaging Spectrometer. And it's, it's actually mounted on the space station. And it has 253 wavelength bands, as opposed to the four we were trying to work with on the Buffalo study from SkySat. Pixels are the same size as Landsat, so not, not great. But you know, 30 meters is pretty decent when you're looking at larger water bodies like this. And we took advantage of existing taxonomic data acquired by our agency and collaborators so that we could compare what we get from remote sensing to field observations. We had a, a lake in New York for a couple of dates, one in Texas, this is right by the airport in Dallas. Um, Upper Klamath Lake became sort of the poster child because it has these beautiful swirls of, of turbulence that um, really stand out. And then another lake in Oregon, we had three separate dates. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go through this whole spaghetti web I just want to point out what's in the middle of all of it is um, an established remote sensing method called multiple end member spectral mixture analysis, and for obvious reasons, better known as MESMA. And the basic principle is you, any pixel is going to consist of some number of end members or, or different kinds of cyanobacteria is what we're interested in. So we can infer the number and type of N members by multiplying their spectra for the various N members by some coefficient. It's, it's just linear algebra. Um, and that weighted linear combination that gives us the best match to the spectrum that we measure within that pixel then becomes the, um, we get the N member fractions. Those fractions are the multipliers on the spectra of each of the, the N members, okay? So we can take an image like this with these, um, this is just a standard RGB image of Upper Klamath Lake in Oregon, and apply this MESMA algorithm using the end members from our library, as well as one water end member is important to include as well. And a phanosomenon was a dominant genus that was um, obtained through uh, sampling and calculating percent biovolumes. And it's also what was predicted for the majority of the lake um, with this MESMA approach. So that was very encouraging. And then uh, Owasco Lake in upstate New York, another DSIS image there. You can see how green the water is. There's a little bit of cloud cover here, but not enough to preclude us from doing it. And in this case, microcystis was observed in field samples and also detected in, in the image-based classification. And that's important because microcystis is potentially toxigenic. So this is something that really could be a harmful algal bloom. So um, as I said, our ongoing work is focused on expanding that spectral library, getting different taxa, looking at different life stages. These things have, you know, they, they, they change over time, just like humans. Um, and then we also want to get along with the sample, some information on water chemistry that we could help to maybe infer what favors the growth of certain kinds of of cyanobacteria. Um, the image processing workflow can be streamlined. You know, this, this was a lot of, it really pushed my coding capabilities last summer when I was really deep into this. And ultimately, I'd love to see this packaged up into, um, you know, more of a real software program that could be available for end users. And then there are, in addition to these, some other hyperspectral sensors that have just launched. So we want to expand it and there's nothing particular about the algorithm that is tied to any one sensor. So I'm pretty optimistic about that working. And 
as I've complained about multiple times already, <laughs> the paper going along with all this is, is still in review. So we've done one round of revisions, we had good comments, I think we addressed them thoroughly, so hopefully it'll be accepted soon. So that was uh, a lot to digest and thank you for, for listening and hopefully I have some time for questions now too. That was great. Thanks, Carl. I'm, I'm sure there will be some questions. So why don't we open it up? We have a little bit of time here. Becky, I think you're first up. Sure. And thanks, Carl, so much for being willing to present on this. It's, it's really yeah, interesting. Um, I guess in terms of um, water depth in which you're getting um, for the, the last part of the presentation, and then how how much time of day would influence if you're dealing with some of those being a, a buoyant planktonic cyanobacteria, would that affect when you're doing Yeah, that's the, a really good question, yeah. one I have, have already thought about, and I'm extremely curious <laughs> to find the answer. And um, so Tyler and I have just submitted a proposal um, that we're pretty optimistic will be supported. Um, to focus on various algae issues in, in, in Idaho. But one of the main topics we intend to investigate is the, the temporal variation because there, it's a type of satellite sensor that I haven't, um, didn't mention in this talk because we haven't used it yet, but it's, um, it's actually a constellation. There's 200 of these things, they call them CubeSats, they're like the size of a bread box. And it's operated by a company called Planet Labs. Like they're the same one that does the sky set that I use in the Buffalo, but they're called Planet Scope. And these things, because there are so many and they have some pointing capability, they can image a given place on Earth multiple times per day. So that opens up the um, possibility of, of really honing in on, yeah, does it matter if you do this at noon later in the day? And I think it could have some really sobering implications for some of the work we've done here. You know, like those, a couple of those DSIS images were four or five days before or after the, uh, the satellite, I mean, the field observations. And I think having that really high frequency planet data could show us just how dynamic these things could be and might um, help to, you know, show us just how much of a premium we need to place in trying to coordinate field sampling with satellite overpasses. So stay tuned. Thanks. Other questions? Rich? Oh, you're on mute, Rich. Thanks, Carl. Thanks for the talk, appreciate it. Um, what determines how long you can it takes before you can receive and view a satellite image? You'd mentioned it's less than 12 hours. What, what are the factors that go into that? Uh, there's some of it, is just the hardware and like literally beaming down the information to, uh, um, you know, we you use download for like a PDF, but this is really downloading. It's like from outer space to the earth. So there's that piece of it. And then um, the USGS has um, EROS, is Earth Resources Observation System. It's a massive data center in South Dakota. And then they, they get the stuff, put it onto their distribution portal. So there's some sort of like, you know, cloud data management components involved there. Gotcha. So that, that, that 12 hour that I said, that was, uh, that's actually a slide I borrowed from Tyler. So I'm not sure if it was Landsat or Sentinel. Sentinel is the one that's similar, but it's operated by the European Space Agency. Um, the planet scope stuff, I think is, you might be able to get it, you know, with, certainly within that same day. Um, we're still looking into that because I can access the planet scope data. We have an agreement between the USGS and NASA that allows us to, to download planet scope data. But one um, hitch in that agreement is that there's a 30 day latency period. So Tyler and I actually have a, a meeting scheduled with planet tomorrow to find out what it would cost for us to get more like a subscription so that we can get over that. Um, time lag limitation, because one of the gotcha. main reasons for pursuing that is uh, to, to get it out in real time, you know, like, okay, yep, better close the beach today. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Keith. Hey, Carl. Um, Thank you. Thanks nice for this you. great talk. Yeah, nice to see you again. Um, when you've looked at the hyperspectral data, how far do you think you could get 
in identifying with multispectral data from like something like Ulchi or, or Sentinel-2? Like, have you, do you think you could get to like groups like uh, Yeah, so one thing we talked about as we we're working on this SNASH paper was um, like cyanobacteria functional groups. Mm -hmm. You know, would maybe not be specific at the genus level, but um, you know, the more you aggregate, I think the less you have to try to tease out. Yeah, let me just go back to show the spectra, you know, like, so uh, this anabina, the, the top line here, like you can see there's some pretty distinct dips. These are absorption features like 675. We're not seeing your screen yet. Oh. You'll need to share again, Carl, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, Yeah, it all made perfect sense to me to go. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so yeah, just to, to address Keith's question, I was going to show how with these, these are the lab spectra, but so the anabina is the brightest one here. And you can see there's some pretty distinct peaks and valleys. These are absorption features by certain pigments, like 675 is the chlorophyll itself. So you can see how if you have broader bands, those are going to get smeared out. And so it's a good question because the hyperspectral stuff is more specialized. We have to, for the DSIS at least, we're having to put in requests to get the data. So if we, that's kind of where we're at now is we're coordinating with other USGS field offices to find out when they're gonna be doing sampling and then just throwing our hat in the ring and trying to get an image around the same time. And you know, obviously hoping that there's no clouds either, which is um, one reason for working in at least the Southern part of Idaho. Carl, just to follow on with that, what, what do eukaryotic algae cause for interference, if anything, in these mixed spectra analyses? Um, that's another thing we want to ex expand on because the, everything that we did in this initial study for SNASH was just based off these cyanobacteria in the library. Mm -hmm. But when we augment it, we want to incorporate other kinds of, of algae as well because those can be, uh, you know, maybe not toxic like microcystis but clogged drinking water intakes you know all kinds of other things even if they're not overtly poisonous so still something we want to be able to monitor okay all right we're running a little bit behind uh okay. so um probably we should uh move on yeah and uh if anyone does have any further questions i this slide was on there for a while but there's my email address just cjl so please uh, reach out with any any further Questions and thanks again for the invitation to present. Okay, thank you. That was a right. great talk. Thank you, everyone. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, Ed Culver, and he's going to talk to us about fish fish tissue monitoring program. Um, and Ed, if you want to share, you're up. And we're seeing your main image and then the, the next slide as well. That, oh, that, okay, I yeah. see. So uh, I need to actually share a different screen. So I need yeah, to if you this. if you do the upper middle part and under display settings and pull down and do the swap, usually okay. that fixes yeah. that. There. How's, uh, how's that? That works. Okay, great. Um, and do you by chance see yourselves if I put this on this screen? I'm not sure what you mean by okay. see yourselves, but that's fine. I will, I will just minimize for, for the, during the talk. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is, uh, Edward Culver, uh, and I'm the fisheries biologist for East Bay Regional Park District in, uh, Oakland, California. Um, I thought it was super interesting um, to hear a talk about the uh, Illinois River um, a little bit uh, before this. Uh, I did my master's uh, research on the Illinois River, and so um, I'm very intimately aware of, of the Illinois River. So I, I just thought that was super interesting to, uh, for that. But um, I'm actually here today to uh, talk about uh, microcystin testing um, in recreational fishing lakes uh, in the East Bay Regional Park District. So a little bit of background about our park district. Um, there are, uh, our motto is uh, healthy parks, healthy people. Uh, we manage and preserve a natural and cultural resource uh, for all to enjoy and, and to protect. 
Um, and our parks are uh, really an ideal location for uh, helpful recreation and uh, environmental education. Um, we have over 25 million visitors annually to uh, a system that comprises 73 parks spanning across 125,000 acres, um, 1,250 miles of trails, uh, 55 miles of shorelines, which includes uh, five fishing piers. Um, and then uh, we also have uh, uh, fishing, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. So fishing, um, I believe, uh, is a, uh, a recreational opportunity that helps create a bond um, between the park users and water and, and the environment as a whole. Um, and, and so we, we currently offer um, fishing opportunities at 10 fishing reservoirs, uh, seven of which are, are stocked. And uh, we typically stock uh, rainbow trout. So I added a photo from of a rainbow trout. Um, so a major part of our fish, uh, our, our fishing activities revolves around these fish stocking programs. Uh, we plant upwards of 100,000 pounds of rainbow trout a year, as well as about 20,000 pounds of channel catfish per year. Uh, we host several fishing derbies where we invite um, disabled veterans, um, special needs kids, um, kids who have never gone fishing before. Um, we have fishing fairs. Uh, we have my first fish events, which is the, the kids who've never gone fishing before. And we offer numerous classes uh, uh, for to fish, fly tie, um, how to uh, fly fish um, all across the park district. Um, uh, in addition to those activities, uh, CDFW also stocks uh, thousands of pounds of hatchery fish in each of these reservoirs uh, every year. Um, in addition to these put and take fisheries, um, each reservoir hosts diverse populations of, of resident uh, fish, including uh, reproducing populations of largemouth bass, uh, sunfish, uh, bluegill and green sunfish predominantly, and, and then common carp. Um, and and uh, as, a, as a public park district, uh, the health and safety of our patrons and the park users is, is always a priority for us. Um, and so we have assisted with the collection of fish testing uh, for years uh, and, and, and our stocked fish have shown a, a low risk and, and are not something that have been incorporated into recommendations, um, but it was determined that, that resident fish do exhibit a, uh, a somewhat uh, higher risk due to prolonged exposure. Um, so a little bit of background about, um, uh, um, I guess, uh, cyanobacteria or, or microcystin testing in the park district. Um, so 2014 was really the, the first year that we documented my, uh, uh, toxins in a lake, uh, uh, Lake Temescal, which is the, the number three right here, um, experienced our first documented cyanotoxins um, uh, uh, in 2014. However, since 2014, um, really, almost every lake that we manage has experienced some sort of danger or closure level uh, using the, the metrics that we have uh, established based off of California guidance. Uh, in addition to uh, our larger reservoirs experiencing some type of danger, um, several of our smaller reservoirs and ponds all across the park district um, have experienced some type of cyanobacteria bloom. Um, and, and so because of this increase in documented danger levels, we, we really wanted to test the fish in reservoirs uh, to ensure that these fish were safe to consume um, after these large cyanobacteria blooms. Um, predominantly, people consume uh, the, the put and take fish, the, the rainbow trout and the channel catfish, but there are a contingent of people who, who do consume largemouth bass if, if they're caught. Um, so we wanted to test and, and see that, that, um, that those fish were, were safe to consume. Um, and, and so one of the things that we wanted to test was both the, the fillets as well as the livers. Um, predominantly people eat uh, fillets and, and don't tend to eat guts uh, or, or livers or, or any sort of body parts, but um, we, we wanted to test both just to, to, to see um, the liver tends to be the bioaccumulation spot in, in a lot of places. So we wanted to see in, in those places. Um, so some, some the, the history of the, the data collections thus far. Uh, so after those first uh, closures due to cyanotoxins in Lake Temescal, uh, CDFW and East Bay Parks uh, went out and surveyed and collected resident bluegill, green sunfish, hybrids of those two, so Lepomus uh, green sunfish bluegill hybrids, and resident largemouth bass. 
Uh, and, and the result of this is that none of the fish tested had um, microcystin toxins in, in any of the samples that, that were tested at Lake Temescal. So in 2015, uh, we had lots of, uh, or not lots, we had several advisories for toxins at Lake Chabot. Uh, these advisories also corresponded with several reports of dog deaths that, that, that may have been associated with the, the cyanotoxins. Uh, so once again, um, CDFW and East Bay Parks uh, went out and, and collected resident rainbow, or I'm sorry, resident largemouth bass and resident common carp. Um, these fish were tested and no microcystin toxins were detected in any of the samples from, from either of these species of fish. So in 2016, uh, this is the first year that, uh, that uh, East Bay Parks collected the data uh, um, and, pro and sent the data out to be processed. Uh, CDFW did not participate in the data collection. This is mostly because we, you know, we had the ability in-house to do it. Um, so in 2016, we, uh, we collected resident largemouth bass and common carp and stocked channel catfish and rainbow trout uh, from Lake Chabot and Lake Del Val. Uh, we, had these process, or we had these samples run and processed by Greenwater Labs, uh, and the results of this were that no toxins were detected in any samples from stocked fish um, for, uh, from, that were taken from the stocking truck. Uh, and, and no toxins were detected in any of the muscle tissue samples. However, toxins were detected in livers of largemouth bass and common carp in Lake Chabot and one largemouth bass from Del Val. Uh, the largemouth bass livers were, were all well below the 20 part per billion uh, CC Habs recommended do not eat level. Uh, however, the common carp livers were above the, uh, the 20 parts per billion do not eat level. So after 2016, um, we, we decided that it was, it was probably important for us to do uh, more of an annual monitoring of this um, and, and wanted to sort of establish a, a routine uh, sampling uh, metric. So uh, we ended up uh, partnering with Ben Genetics uh, in Sacramento for them to process our tissue, sample, tissue samples. Um, so once, once uh, the 2016 field season was over, we began collecting uh, five legal catchable length uh, largemouth bass from each lake during our annual night surveys. Um, because our stocked fish did not have any microcystins present in any samples, we're fairly confident that the stocked fish do not have microcystins. And so we do not plan to continue to test stocked fish, save maybe once every five years. Um, most of our stocked rainbow trout are harvested by anglers or other predators within a few weeks to a month of stocking. Um, so we believe that the potential exposure from rainbow trout is fairly negligible. Um, channel catfish have been shown to survive years after stocking um, and so could theoretically accumulate, uh, bioaccumulate microcystins. Um, however, our annual surveys are conducted in the summer, which is catfish stocking season. Um, so it would be impossible for us to be able to tell the difference between a theoretical resident channel catfish and, and a catfish that just got recently stocked from a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we primarily decided to focus on, on our, our resident uh, largemouth bass and common carp in places that we can collect common carp. So uh, starting in 2017, as I said, we, we collected resident largemouth bass from Lake Chabot, uh, Lake Temescal and Del Val, and common carp from Lake Chabot and Del Val. Uh, no toxins were detected in muscle tissue samples from any of the fish. Liver samples from nearly all fish had microcystins, but they were below the 20 part per billion threshold. There was one largemouth bass from Lake Chabot that had microcystins in their liver higher than 20 part per billion, and most common carp from Lake Chabot had liver samples with microcystins higher than 20 part per billion. In 2018, again, we collected resident largemouth bass uh, from each of these lakes, uh, Lake Chabot, Lake Temescal, Del Val, Contra Loma, and Quarry Lakes, and common carp from Lake Chabot and Del Val. And uh, there were no toxins detected in any of the muscle samples from any of these fish. Uh, liver samples from every lake but Lake Temescal had microcystins. However, most largemouth bass uh, had toxins less than 20 parts per billion, 
save uh, three largemouth bass from lake Chabot that had uh, microcystins higher than 20 parts per million in their rivers. Excuse me. In 2019, we collected uh, resident largemouth bass from Lake Chabot, Lake Delval, Contraloma, and Quarry Lakes, and common carp from Lake Chabot and Lake Delval. Uh, the results of this showed that no toxins were detected in any muscle tissue samples of any fish. Liver samples from every lake had microcystins. However, none of them had uh, microcyst liver microcystins higher than 20 parts per billion. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, other people may have experienced this, but uh, because of COVID, uh, we were unable to sample in 2020. Um, so this is sort of a bit of a lost year for us, unfortunately. And then uh, going into last year, we were fortunate enough to be able to modify our, our um, electrofishing requirements so that we, we could, in fact, go out and, and collect some fish. So we, we were fortunate enough to collect fish, our largemouth bass from Lake Chabot, Lake Delval, uh, Contraloma, Lake Temescal, and Quarry Lakes. Um, microcystins were, microcystin toxins were detected in one muscle tissue sample from Lake Temescal. Liver samples showed three largemouth bass from Lake Chabot with higher concentrations than the 20 part per million threshold. Um, so in total, uh, from 2016 to 2021, um, from these five reservoirs, we have collected over 150 fish and, and had each of these fish tested um, for microcystins, both in, in mu or muscle tissues and liver tissues. And using that data, uh, we have been able to provide specific recommendations for fish consumption advisories for our lakes. Um, and, and, and so when there are uh, cyanobacteria blooms in the lakes, uh, we are able to, to uh, to say to indicate that as long as the fillets are cleaned and, and the guts are thrown away and, and fillets are cleaned with uh, tap water before that, that, we, that we believe that uh, they are safe to, to consume and the data supports that. Um, our data also shows that uh, stocked rainbow trout and channel catfish have shown no toxins. Uh, our resident fish uh, have shown toxins, uh, including one fillet sample from 2021, which uh, I will talk about uh, uh, deeper as we get further into the discussion. Um, so our, our data has really shown that even during periods of, of high water uh, microcystin concentrations, this typically doesn't translate into fish tissues aside from the liver. Um, and our advis advisories do indicate that people should only eat the meat and discard the skin, fat, and guts. Uh, so uh, just again to uh, quickly cover um, before I go into some of the statistics, uh, our stocked fish, our rainbow trout, our, we're very fortunate to be able to stock um, some lightning trout uh, in, at, around uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas time, and then our channel catfish. Um, uh, none of these fish that have been tested have exhibited any signs of microcystin toxins. Um, so I'm going to move into the common carp first. Uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, we really only regularly catch common carp at Lake Chabot and Del Val. And so because there's only two lakes to compare, it makes the statistics uh, a little bit easier to explain in, in this particular instance. Um, so uh, in the take home message of this statistic is that um, if this number is negative, that means that the, the second value is, is significantly higher than the first value. Um, or, or the first value is significantly less than the second value. So the take home here is that uh, for, for livers, for common carp, uh, uh, the uh, Lake Chabot has a significantly higher microcystin concentration in those livers when compared to uh, fish from Lake Delval. And, and uh, actually running a, a, a comparison of these gives a p-value that's uh, very highly significant. Um, so yeah, so just to show that, it, um, that in this particular instance, Lake Chabot is significantly higher than Lake Del Val. Uh, so moving into largemouth bass, uh, I first wanted to look at uh, liver results by year. Um, using analysis of variance, uh, you can really see um, that there is no um, statistical difference between the, the five years that we've sampled and that um, almost all fish are below this 20 um, almost all livers are below this 20 part per million threshold with a few outliers from 2017, 18, and 2021. Uh, when, when we then 
combine these livers by lake, however, you can see that all of those different years sort of fall into one lake. Um, and you can see that it is statistically significant to show that uh, Lake Chabot has a uh, significantly higher microsystem concentration in livers from largemouth bass when compared to any other lake. And, and this is a, a highly significant value. And you can see that, that almost all of the, the fish collected are still below this 20 part per billion threshold in, in liver concentrations. So uh, to show this more of as a stepwise comparison, we don't have to spend too much time here because um, it, it's a little busy, but just to show the statistics behind it, this is a stepwise comparison showing each of the different lakes. And um, when, when the uh, mean and the two standard deviation antenna cross this, this zero line, it means that there is no uh, variation between the two lakes tested. Um, so you can see on the bottom here, these four uh, don't cross this mean line, which means that they are uh, significantly different from one another. Um, so positive in this case would mean that Lake Chabot is significantly higher than Contra Loma. And then in the next instance, it would be um, each of these lakes, Lake Temescal, Quarry Lakes, and Lake Del Val are significantly less than Lake Chabot. And uh, when running all of these comparisons together, this shows a incredibly significant p-value. Uh, so when looking at fillets uh, and fillet results by year, uh, we've, we've never seen any um, microcystins in any of the fillets, save one fish from, from 2021. Uh, statistically, this is not significant, and um, our statistics showed this as being an outlier fish. Uh, when you uh, when you show these results by lake, it's it shows the exact same thing. It's it's just one outlier fish, um, and then again, um, sort of showing this stepwise comparison because all of these cross this red zero line. There is no significant difference between largemouth bass fillets uh, in any of the lakes that we test. Um, so actually, to talk about this this one fillet. Um, we're actually sort of fairly confident that the one largemouth bass collected from Lake Temescal with microsystems may have been an error. Um, and because we think it was an error, uh, we, we really plan to institute um, much more uh, stringent cleaning between fish and between processing of fish and liver samples. Um, it's very possible that some form of cross-contamination occurred um, because processing of these fish typically occurs either lakeside or, uh, or uh, on the lake itself. Um, and additionally, uh, we've spoken with managers from the Ben Genetics who does our, our statistics or who does our analyses, and they indicated that blood may have actually gotten um, on the fillet sample, we may not have cleaned it properly, and that that may have uh, impacted the toxins. So moving forward, we think having a much more rigid standard operating procedure that, that we can avoid cross-contamination issues. So at this time, we're fairly confident that, that, that it's a cross-contamination issue. Um, so just to quickly summarize, uh, aside from one largemouth bass collected in 2021, um, no fillet samples have ever had any detectable toxins. Uh, liver samples from largemouth bass and common carp frequently have toxins, which are less than the 20 part per billion threshold. And finally, Lake Chabot is significantly higher in toxin concentrations in both largemouth bass and common carp livers than any other lake that was tested. Um, and with that, I uh, can take any questions and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Ed. That was great. Um, we have time for some questions. Sarah. Hey, that was a great presentation and I'm, I'm so glad to um, hear of your study. Um, and how uh, you know you did it for several years in, in multiple um, lakes. So that's that's great. Um, one question I had from you or for you was uh, what the toxin concentrations were in those water bodies. It might be helpful to see that information along with the um, you know with the fish tissue. Yeah, absolutely. I, it uh, it definitely varies a lot. Um, what we had thought of doing was. Um, providing the, the toxin levels at the time that we collected the fish, but because we're collecting like legal catchable fish, 
you know, the, the likelihood is that these largemouth bass have been in the lake for, for years. They're, you know, they're very likely three to four years old when we catch them. So I think it would be interesting to sort of have like the last four years of, of cyanotoxin data for, for each of those lakes. So yeah, great point. Well, do, do you, I don't know if you have that information handy, but like, can you give, you know, do you, what's the highest level that you saw in like Lake Chabot? I may have to, uh, push or I may have to pass that question to Hal McLean, who is our okay. water management person who actually does. I sort of, I every once in a while collect water samples, but I'm uh, definitely a fish person. Um, I do think that uh, we have had cyanotoxins and, and um, closures related to cyanotoxins at each of our lakes that we've sampled. Um, so I think definitely within the last few years, we have seen uh, dangers at, at each of these lakes. Um, how high they were, I don't know if I can say that, but maybe Hal can. Hi, this is, yeah, this is Hal. Thanks for the question, Sarah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we mostly run our samples through our uh, CAS, Cyanobacteria Automated Assay System, and so we, and uh, we're getting a uh, maximum of 50 parts per billion on, on our limits for our cast. And um, we don't necessarily run Lake Chabot very often on it because we don't do a lot of recreation. There's not body contact recreation on that lake. Um, we do have closure data, like the, uh, the range of closures. And we are we, we do re, uh, require like two uh, weeks or two, two, yeah, two weeks of sampling below the danger level to take a, uh, an, a danger advisory down. So uh, we, we could get you that information and the danger advisory level doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it, the, the tests are currently high. But again, most of our samples are run through our CAS, so we would go up to 50 parts per billion as, as much as possible as, as we're, we're getting. Uh, initially, when we did test Lake Chabot and Temescal at other labs in the 2014 and 2015, we got some astronomical numbers, but um, the media really kind of blew that out of proportion as far as, I don't know, it, 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 it's hard to put a scope on like how much toxins you're getting when you really have a bias sample. And we're, we are collecting bias samples to, for health and safety. And so um, once we're over the danger, we, we're not too concerned about what those numbers are. So. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have those types of numbers. Uh, Jamie and then Becky, I think you had questions. Jamie, you may be muted. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, I think that was a great talk. I was curious, it sounds like you had maybe a couple different labs working on the tissue samples over time. Were they all following the same kind of protocols or are you working with different, different analysis protocols? So this is, I, you might have seen in the presentation that I only did statistical analysis from 2017 to 2021. Mm -hmm. um, so 2014 um, was, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly which lab, uh, the fish were collected and processed by CDFW in okay. both 2014 and 15. Um, and, and so I don't know what protocols they followed. Uh, we really only received notice that was like, none of the fish had microsystems. Um, in 2016, we, we sort of, I'm going to call it, we soft started uh, uh, our long-term monitoring and, and went with um, Greenwater Labs and, and sort of after that year uh, decided to, to go with somewhere local that, localer that we could send our, our data to. So from 2017 on, 
the same protocols have been followed, I can assure you. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know about before that, which is why I didn't include it in the statistical analysis. And sort of as Hal said, there, there are a couple numbers that um, seem really weird um, in, in, in some of those earlier reports. Um, so I'm, I'm mostly confident with the 2017 onward data. So that's what I tried to present on. Yeah, thank you. And and can I ask a follow up question on that? Do you, so it sounds like, um, do you know if they were using like a LCMS based 2017 forward or if it's an ELISA based or you're not? Oh, I think it's ELISA. Okay. I, I can pull it up really quick, but I'm I'm like 99% sure it's ELISA. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Becky? Yeah, great. Um, thanks. I, I had a, a similar question. Um, and um, but I'll just follow on that is um, I know there's some work at the national level on fish tissue methods. And so I, I certainly uh, uh, support and, uh, and appreciate all the work you've done to document the, the fish fillets. If there is a, um, an, a standardized method that comes out in the, in the future to try to look at um, tissue bound um, microsystems. Um, I know they're they're publishing on that now, and and as it sort of becomes adopted, um, it might be good to to at least kind of do a check on on fish fillets with with that. Um, and just to clarify, um, at, I'm I'm not exactly sure um, what what you're looking at, but um, um, the danger level for the the 20 microgram per liter would be a water threshold um, where we do the signage. Um, but if you look at, at the OEHA 2012 fish, human fish tissue consumption rate, that's a that's a different number. So um, just for um, potential clarification, but I certainly appreciate that, you know, where you've got detects and where you're seeing uh, fish fillets um, um, is not being a problem because you're not even getting a detect. So. Um, just just a couple uh, points, but really appreciate all the work you guys are doing to uh, um, make sure that this is um, being collected and, and validated and um, addressed accordingly. So thank you. Jenna, do you have one last question? Yeah, this is Jenna Rindy. I'm the CDSW Harm for Algal Bloom coordinator. So I was furiously taking notes uh, in this presentation. And if you have a report or anything, I would just really like if you could share it or something I would or we could talk. Um, I'm trying to think about for other like water bodies of priority, the ones you all list are definitely water bodies of priority for our department, but then also um, I'm just trying to figure out planning for future years. So I just love to learn as much as possible. And mm -hmm. We have an annual report that we submit every year. I think it might be to the water board, so it might not be to you, but uh, I have it hot and fresh. Uh, send me an email okay. and I will send it right back to you. Great, thank you. <laughs> sure. Okay, thanks. That's great information. Uh, I think we are now gonna move on to the regional coordinator updates. Uh, and I think Marissa wanted to start with a comment, didn't you, Marissa? Thanks, Dave. Um, let me move this out of the way a little bit. So um, just to um, help start up the regional updates, we wanted to give a quick statewide update from the Water Boards program. And most of this is um, some stuff that's been going on through the libraries list for CCHAB. Just wanted to um, recap a couple things. So um, first off, pre-holiday assessments. So these are the harmful algal bloom um, Kind of surveys that are done um, prior to major summer, or, you know, summer season um, holiday weekends, and uh, this started many years ago. First off, with Labor Day weekend, and most recently last year, we began expanding it for from Memorial Day weekend to in Independence Day weekend to then Labor Day. So we've got three survey periods, and um, we distributed the flyer. Um, to announce it um, a couple months ago, and there's a survey to complete if you'd like to participate. So if you'd like to um, collaborate with us, um, please let us know. And also if you'd like to su submit um, your data independent 
of, you know, um, going through our, um, our kind of like a support processes, um, both options are available and um, the survey period for collecting samples begins on the 10th of May. Um, so in several weeks, I just wanted to give a little update on that again, and we'll put another reminder out on the Lyris list, um, sorry, or the listserv. And also um, about two years ago, we first started, um, sorry, it was the first time that we offered um, pre printed durable signs and distributed those to local entities and water managers. And we're happy to be able to announce that we're collaborate, collaborating again with Squirp to um, provide um, additional durable signs. So we're going to be sending out that announcement on the um, listserv shortly. And again, a survey <laughs> to let us know what um, advi advisory general awareness signs that you're interested in. And the signs that are up for taking um, or what we'll be printing are the um, the planktonic trigger level signs um, from caution, warning, and danger, and also printing the um, two different uh, signs for uh, benthic algae or toxic algae, uh, including the general awareness sign, which is not an advisory sign, but also the one level of, um, kind of ad advisory or alert sign that is available for benthics. Um, depending on funding, we might have the general awareness sign also for just generally haves available, but we're not sure yet, just depending on the amount of need and requests that come out. And again, the survey's open to you know, all entities that manage waterways and local counties. And lastly, um, many of you are aware of our weekly updates lists that are sent out. Um, they look like this. Um, but these are the reports that were updated in the last seven days. These go out on Fridays. Um, we've been asked by many um, kind of like local agencies if we could make a listserv that sends out just, you know, program notifications and anything related to kind of like a policy development. Um, so um, we've been the okay to um, launch a listserv just for the HAB program announcements. And that's going to be really refined just to, you know, these notifications and anything policy-wise that comes forward over the next few years. So it'll be, you know, just weekly updates for right now. Um, so we're gonna launch that listserv and in talking with some folks, you know, we're concerned, you know, we don't want CC have members um, or subscribers to lose getting this notification. So um, it was proposed that we would automatically um, sign up all subscribers from the CC have listserv to um, this uh, dedicated notifications listserv. And um, just wanted to kind of say that and see if there's any, any heartburn about that. Um, we just didn't wanna uh, force, you know, over a thousand subscribers to have to sign up individually. Um, so we're just gonna take some comments on that if you um, feel like commenting on this proposal and uh, um, continue speaking to the co-chairs about this before we go forward. And that's the conclusion of my updates. Um, just wanted to see if there's any chats. It doesn't look like it. Okay. Any comments before we move to the regions? Okay. Well, Marissa, some links. Oh, also there we go. In the chats. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. Um, I know, and I apologize if I've forgotten on this, and and maybe it's tied to the database update for the um signage for the benthic um i know it's kind of hard to fit that into the current map framework and then how it gets on that update um right. but is that something that's gonna revise in the future to sort of clarify when when it is a, a benthic yeah yeah so just to recap um all um kind of uh trigger level signs that with the yellow banner are covered under caution and then put out on that weekly update and again, let's um, put, you know, caution here. Um, so we use um, currently on the map. There's only values for you know no advisory caution warning or danger. Um, so we've been putting if there's a toxic algae alert posted for benthics, um, we've been using the caution um, to make it a yellow dot. And um, with the modernization of the HAB database, um, we um, are working to um, provide a different you know le legend on the map 
to capture the toxic algae alert. We haven't gotten that finalized yet. We're hoping that that will go um, forward in May along with the database going alive. Um, otherwise, if we can't make that work, um, when we, we do have plans to redesign our entire mapping system um, beginning in the fall, and that would take several months, of course, because we're going to um, you know, make it based off of our needs um, and meet a lot of what stakeholders need to, to see as well. So um, it might be more of a long-term project to be able to see if, if it's a benthic alert yellow dot. <laughs> so um, I, I can't say um, necessarily if it's going to be um, going live in May, but we, we hope we can make that work. Got some mock-ups, but I'm not sure if it will actually work once we go live. <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks. Well, I, I know there's usually that level of clarification if people look at the details on that yeah. uh, given location. That will, but I just... And that will be more clear with the database going live. There's going to be pre, um, pre-worded um, choices for the advisory details to choose from. So it'll clearly say if, if that um, advisory is due to toxic algae alert or a planktonic caution sign. Um, but it might not be visible easily at a glance until you hover over it and see the pop-up. Okay, we good? Yeah. All right, then I think we're ready for the regions. So um, let's see, why don't we go back to participation view here and uh, regions please uh, identify yourself when you when you sign on and um, we'll go through we'll go through the various regions uh, region number one is somebody on I guess this used to be a time when we wouldn't expect too much because we're sort of early in the growing season but times are changing so not really sure what to expect here region one yeah hi this is uh, Mike Thomas with region one. Um, sorry, I'm not using my usual internet or workspace today, so I don't have any slides or camera to share with you. Um, but as you mentioned, things are pretty quiet. Um, we did have a brief caution up in Thule Lake, uh, a couple of hits on the satellite imagery that we're checking out. Uh, but most of the reports that we have received are uh, filamentous green algae. Um, as uh, Marissa just alluded to, we're working with our partners on the pre-holiday assessments. Uh, we will be sampling nine water bodies for each holiday event. Uh, a couple of updates of uh, what's coming out of our region in terms of papers and reports. Uh, I was, as was mentioned earlier in the presentation, we have that benthic uh, cyanobacteria and cyan cyanotoxin report that was released in February. Uh, be sure to check that out. We identify uh, benthic cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins of concern, compare various lab and monitoring techniques, uh, and then provide uh, recommendations for a successful monitoring program for our partners. And that's basically uh, using SPATs, uh, uh, implementing visual surveillance, and then doing a periodic benthic mat testing. But uh, Rich will, Rich Fadness, um, we'll be reporting on that report or presenting on that report during the next CC Hab meeting in July. Uh, coming up, uh, we are also working on a SPAT report uh, where we're trying to kind of determine the optimal um, deployment length for SPATs in rivers. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And let's see. Uh, also, we are going to be hosting a partner training in uh, mid-May. Um, so we will we have reached out to our regional partners and we'll be uh, providing that virtual training then. And that's about all I have to report on. Great. Thank you. Region two. Hi, Rebecca Nordenholt from Region two. Um, also don't have much. To update, we are planning to do some holiday assessments. So we're working to identify um, recreational water bodies that aren't being monitored right now. So we can try and get some monitoring done prior to the holidays. And that's about it. We've been working with State Board to try and get us more HAB resources so we can do more. Um, yeah, that's it. Great, thank you. Region three. Uh, 
Do we have anyone from Region 3 on the line? Um, Region 3 wasn't able to attend today, but they wanted us to let you guys know that they're also planning to participate in the holiday assessments targeting um, around six water bodies, Laguna, Lopez, um, Nascimento, San Antonio, and possibly also the Santa Margarita. Um, and they're also hoping that Pinto Lake will also submit samples um, for this year. Great, thank you. Region four. Uh, yes, this is Stephanie from Region 4. So I'm here on behalf of Emily, who's like on leave. Um, I don't really have um, much updates apart from the contract that is ongoing to, um, to study the harmful algae bloom in the lakes. that is, you know, still ongoing with the squad. I think that's all that I have. Okay, thank you. Region five. Hi, this is Karen Atkins over at Central Valley. Um, we have some blooms going on in Eastman. I think we have a caution and Hensley, we have a danger. Um, Isabella still looks good. Stockton is starting to have a couple um, and the Delta area is starting to have a couple cautions, but it's mostly still good. I'm sure Sarah will update y'all more on um, Clear Lake, so I won't go too much into that. Um, but those are the main bloom events. And in addition to that, I just wanted to mention, we did a two-day training um, just the other week with Restore the Delta down in Stockton. That went quite well. And they're gonna be doing some monitoring um, at around seven sites, maybe a couple more in the Stockton area. Um, and be doing cyano, uh, the strip tests for cyanotoxins, and then also be sending in some to bend. Um, in addition to that, on Friday, uh, Janice Cook and I will be presenting at our board meeting about um, just an update of our efforts for HABs in the area. So if you're interested, please sign on for that. That's all. Sarah, if you want to update too. Sure. Um, thanks, Karen. For Clear Lake, um, we've been, uh, the, the Big Valley has been doing monthly cyanotoxin sampling through the winter season and early spring. Um, we have had a couple of cautions, nothing over two micrograms per liter for microcystin. We are doing microscopy at the sites where we are seeing some anatoxin producers, so uh, like FM Zamanon, but um, we have, uh, we've done some qPCR analysis and uh, those have come back no detect for anything other than microcystin. Um, we are uh, doing a, a training for tribes in California um, for setting up harmful algal bloom monitoring programs, so uh, which is happening next week. Um, so um, we have about 15 uh, tribes signed up, so that'll be exciting. We'll be taking them through how we've been doing it over here at Clear Lake and also um, giving them information about the state's SOPs and, you know, SWAMPS program for that. Um, and we will be doing our, oh, um, we're also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing benthic cyanobacteria analysis using SPAT bags um, and uh, also some grab samples in the in some of the creeks in the county. So we're uh, sending off the, our first uh, set of SPAT bags this, uh, this week and are looking forward to seeing what that says. Um, and I think that's it. We'll be doing the, we're going to uh, bi-weekly monitoring um, within the next month or month and a half. Great, thank you. Region six. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Sabrina Rice from Lahontan Water Board and um, it's also relatively slow for us right now as well, but I do have a few updates. Um, so we responded to a few reports of blooms within Lake Tahoe this season. Um, they've all been on the west shore. And this time of year, we do get a lot of reports in Tahoe because of the 
large quantities of paraphyton that grow this time of year. And um, when the wind and wave action disturbs it, it will detach from the rocks, you know, and wash up along the shore. Um, but I've taken a few samples from these reports and it's all been eukaryotic algae so far. And then I responded to one bloom that was in the outlet of Taylor Creek, which Taylor Creek, Creek does flow into Lake Tahoe. And um, this creek does kind of pond uh, by one of the beaches and um, the water here did have visual indicators of a bloom. So I took some or took a sample and results indicated that cyanobacteria were present, but there were no toxins. And we also partner with South Tahoe Public Utility District in um, sharing data and sampling Indian Creek Reservoir. This reservoir has a hypolimnetic oxygenation system, so they do sample regularly just to kind of monitor that system. And uh, samples were collected on April 6th that resulted in a warning advisory. And we are also continuing two special studies that, have, that began in 2019. The first special study is monitoring for the effectiveness of a laminar flow aeration system within the Tahoe Keys. This system was originally put in place to mitigate for aquatic invasive species, but we're also sampling to determine um, if it has any effectiveness on mitigating for HABs. And then um, we're also continuing to monitor Red Lake. This lake is in a relatively undisturbed landscape. There's just a uh, like a, a highway that that goes by, but um, it has experienced danger level halves in the past. And lastly, we are just working with old and new partners to monitor for the pre-holiday assessments. And that's it. Great, thank you. Um, you're busy for not being that busy. <laughs> it is good, though, that I, we haven't heard, you know, tales of horror for the most part, which is nice. Um, Region 7. Anyone from Region 7 on? I don't believe so, Dave. Uh, though, okay. I mean, Region 7 on the desert there have been... Uh, monitoring Salton Sea, particularly on the west side shore where there's a little bit more activity. And um, I believe there's a caution advisory there. Great. Region eight. Anyone from region eight? No? Yeah. Is Kirk here? I don't believe so. Um, so for regional board eight, they this is Santa Ana region. They are um, continuing their, uh, right now um, until May, they're doing monthly sampling at Big Bear Lake, um, a little higher elevation, and then in Lake Elsinore. They're continuing a two year study to collect a little bit more information about the phytoplankton and also have toxins to inform um, future you know, development of um, TMBLs and updates to TMBLs. Great, and region nine. Yeah, hi, this is Karina Goda from San Diego region. Um, pretty slow here, mostly good news. Um, our biggest problem child uh, reservoir is Lake Henshaw and it pretty much was blooming and posted for about two years. But this winter, um, the signage was actually able to come down and it's it's been down. Um, there are only two weeks where it was at a caution for anatoxin A detection. So we'll see what the summer brings. I'm not too hopeful, but we'll see. Um, but Vista Irrigation District does weekly monitoring there and they share their data with us, which is great. Um, we did respond to some satellite notifications in January. We were getting a lot for another reservoir, Lower Otai, um, it's the furthest um, south reservoir we have. Weren't able to go out right away when it was at its peak because of Omicron issues, but we got out in February. Um, thankfully, the toxins were not at a level that needed to be posted, but we did um, ID many species of cyanobacteria. Um, but the, there is a water treatment plant there and they weren't 
treating the water from the reservoir. They were, they actually knew about it. They basically just visually, they weren't testing. So they um, partnered with us and they were grateful for our information. Um, and then lastly, we just had uh, just a, a notification come in for a high recreational area in Mount Laguna, where there are two, I would say small lakes kind of ponded areas where um, a lot of dogs and, and kids do go in it. Um, and it was cyanobacteria that someone spotted, but it was frozen over at the time and we were able to sample the little pockets that were bubbling. So um, we did see anabina and microcolia. So that one is on our list to go back in the summertime when it really is in its peak, um, just to make sure that it's okay. So we put that on our pre-holiday um, assessment wish list, and we will be doing the pre-holiday assessments for the state board. And that's all we have. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there are there any other announcements? And we're coming down to the end of it. We actually have a few minutes if we need it, or we can get out a few minutes early. This is Hal McLean with East Bay Parks. Um, we have an interesting uh, new strategy for cyanobacteria issues at Lake Anza. I don't know if anybody's seen the news uh, about the East Bay Lake Lake Anza, but um, it uh, started to have an Azola issue. Well, Azola has completely covered the lake and it's probably a few layers thick by now and we don't detect any cyanobacteria and it's keeping the lake, I think it's about four to six degrees colder than it was this time last year. And we have a hydro, uh, we have an HOS system, hypolimnetic oxygenation system and um, our consultants are saying that it's uh, with the Azola, it's, it's, it's probably keeping it colder and helping us like oxygenate our lake a lot better and, uh, than, than um, if it was warming up with uh, the heat of the sun and everything. So it's kind of an interesting thing. I don't know if uh, anybody's heard about that, but. That's that's wild, Hal. Um, you know, Anna, uh, Azola is often associated, or Anabena is often associated with Azola. Do you know if it's there with it, co-occurring? Uh, we it, haven't seen it, but but yeah, apparently it's supposed to be living inside cells or something. Right. Yeah. Right. But yeah. we we haven't we haven't detected any toxins. Wow. We've had um, th there are parts of the of Clear Lake, especially in the docks in the um, in the winter time that have Azola, and I think it's a nitrogen fixer. Um, so it's, it's just interesting to see uh, how it cycles out and what other what other things come in there. So I would be watching that if I were you. Interesting. Okay. Any other comments then? All right, I think we're coming down to the end of it. Uh, definitely coming down to the end of it for me as co-chair. Uh, I welcome uh, Jamie coming on board. Um, I've had fun. I'm still gonna interact with the mitigation subcommittee. It's, that's always a lot of fun. So um, I'll have a blast doing that. Uh, but it's also been kind of an honor and fun to, to work with Sarah and, and Becky on this. And um, I'm sure I'll be seeing all you guys uh, in the near future. Uh, yes. Thank you so much, Dave, for sure. for all your contributions over the last four four years, <laughs> if not more. Something so, like that. Thank you. Yeah, you've been wonderful to work with, and uh, we're going to miss you. I'm glad Jamie's coming on as well, but um, you've been great to work with us, Coach. Hey, I, I've just been happy I didn't see Will Smith walking towards the podium. Yeah, that's, so I'm I'm good. But, okay, um, I think that's it. If there's anything else, or if there's nothing else. I think we'll all sign off. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thanks so much.